Well, welcome to uh, today's LTCCC webinar, uh, Neglect Leading to Bodily Injury and Death of 300 Long-Term Care Residents. Uh, we have a special guest speaker, uh, Dr. Elon Caspi. And to start, I'm just gonna go over our, our, our agenda very quickly and give a brief introduction about, uh, about Long-Term Care Community Coalition. Uh, then uh, an introduction for, for Elon. So LTCCC is a nonprofit, and I should introduce myself. Uh, my name is Eric Goldwine. I'm the uh, Policy and Communications Director for LTCCC, and LTCCC is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving care and quality of life for the elderly and adult disabled in long-term care. Uh, we are also home to two local New York-based ombudsman programs. And our focus is people who live in nursing homes and assisted living. We do policy analysis, uh, research, uh, systems, advocacy, and we also educate consumers, families, ombudsmen, and other stakeholders. Our website is nursinghome411.org. And I suggest visiting that. And more importantly for today, we are joined by Dr. Elon Caspi, a gerontologist and dementia behavior specialist. He has a dynamic uh, uh, resume. Uh, uh, he's worked as a social worker, educator uh, in research. Uh, he's an assistant research professor at, uh, at UConn. Uh, his focuses range from neglect to resident to resident incidents, financial exploitation, and the goal of his work is enabling vulnerable and frail elders to realize their human right to live with dignity and in safe care environments. And I'm excited for this presentation. Uh, it has a mix of uh, research, of um, of uh, narrative, and uh, he brings uh, just a wide range of expertise. So without further ado, I'm going to stop my screen share and pass it off to Elon. Uh, thank you, Eric, uh, for your kind introduction and also for your help with the preparations for this uh, presentation. Um, I want to thank uh, Richard uh, for inviting me to give this uh, talk today. Um, we will talk today about um, one form of elder mistreatment in long-term care homes, uh, neglect leading to serious bodily injury and death uh, of uh, residents. Um, just going to see that uh, this the first uh, the presentation uh, uploads. I, I I don't see it uh, at this point. I wonder if I should do something to upload it here. Yeah. Uh, so did you get the screen the share screen on? There we go. Thank you. Success. Um, and you want to go uh, slideshow, uh, then. There you go. Uh, so um, looking at the image on the opening slide, uh, we may never know what Charles meant, intended, when he uh, uh, painted uh, this uh, picture. Um, I believe it represents nursing home residents and, and care staff. But at least when looking closely at this form of elder mistreatment, one has to wonder whether vulnerable and frail elders who are severely neglected in a long-term care home, which is their home, are seen as people, as human beings, citizens with equal rights. One also has to wonder uh, whether the people who care for them, vast majority women, are seen and treated as human beings. Uh, we will return to the issue of dignity, which is defined as the state of being worthy of honor or respect, and also to the concept of disregard, disregard of it, of dignity, throughout the presentation. I just want to see that. Yeah. So, so you and if you could press the slide. Uh, there, there we go. We're good now. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm a gerontologist, uh, but I enjoy, I also enjoy carving wood. You can see here some educational signs that I carve, uh, uh, a way to express 
um, you know, uh, what are we aspiring for, you know, to, to listen to the voice of, of vulnerable el elders, to ensure that, um, there, you know, that uh, there is justice, uh, justice is done uh, for elders and that their lives matter. I wanna uh, acknowledge real quick Elder Voice Family Advocates in Minnesota for their uh, help uh, during an early phase of this project. I also wanna thank Lindsay Kruger uh, and her uh, investigators at the Minnesota Department of Health for their hard work uh, investigating various forms of mistreatment in long-term care homes. Chris Sears, uh, a dedicated and extremely uh, skilled uh, reporter at the Star Tribune for his outstanding work in this, uh, in this area. Uh, and Jennifer Siegel for uh, working hard, I should say, to secure permission for using the image on the opening slide. Uh, Elder Voice Family Advocates, these are uh, uh, family members of people uh, who lived in long-term care homes and were um, horrifically uh, neglected, abused, and financially exploited uh, in assisted living residences and care homes throughout uh, Minnesota. Um, and they, they uh, transformed their, their trauma uh, into fierce advocacy to ensure that um, other, other residents will not experience what their loved ones experience. Uh, a really a inspiring uh, group of, of people uh, that I feel honored to, to call myself a colleague uh, of theirs. Um, now, I started working in the aging field 27 years ago as a nurse aide in a nursing home where my grandfather lived. And I know, um, I know that the majority of direct care staff are dedicated hardworking, compassionate, and caring people. And yes, there are good providers out there. Uh, here's a definition uh, of neglect uh, from a Minnesota uh, statute. A failure or mission to provide uh, care or services, including health care or supervision, which is necessary to obtain or maintain health or safety of these individuals. And it's not the result of an accident. Now these services, um, which a reasonable person would deem essential to obtain and maintain the health and safety of vulnerable adults. Here's a definition of physical neglect, failure to provide the services necessary to avoid harm. And I looked uh, in a Webster dictionary, the definition of neglect as a verb, to give little attention or respect to, to leave undone or unattended to, especially through carelessness, which led me to the very uh, important term disregard which is defined as to treat as unworthy of regard or notice. We will return to this term, disregard and dignity throughout the presentation. And maybe better put uh, by an older woman with Alzheimer's disease who in my early study years ago said, I want to know that someone will be there for me when something happens to me. And those of us who work in this field are familiar with the common types of neglect in care homes. Um, just to give a few examples, uh, pressure sores, um, lack of treatment of complex health conditions, um, you know, being left soiled in urine and, and, and bowel movement for extended periods, unsafe transfers, uh, medication errors, and various forms of lack of supervision, as we will see later on today. We also know that neglect is prevalent from various research studies, as well as um, government reports. Uh, I also want to point out a line of research that is uh, called missed care uh, in various uh, countries in recent years. And it, why is it so important to pay attention to the missed care and to the near misses, if you will, because when we don't, they can uh, escalate into uh, neglect. Now, I should say that after reviewing hundreds of investigation reports of uh, neglect of uh, residents, uh, it is important to recognize that some of these incidents are human errors. They are honest mistakes. They could still, uh, some of these could still occur in a system that is um, not uh, supportive or preventive, uh, but the individual himself or herself, uh, in some of these cases, um, uh, made a, 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 a human error, as you will, if you will. Now, we all know that uh, understaffing and poor staffing levels and dangerous staffing levels is a major contributing factor to neglect. In fact, Tom from the AG office, uh, Medicaid Fraud Control Units uh, last fall, I believe in a symposium organized by LTCCC, 
um, he talked about the direct connection between staffing and neglect. And I really appreciate that, that, that he mentioned that. And I call it inhumane and unsafe people to people ratios because it's important to remember that these are people caring for people. Um, we also know that for many years, well prior to the pandemic, there have been uh, um, low staffing levels and, and dangerous staffing levels um, documented in a dozen recent studies um, over the years. And um, we're also aware of uh, ways some nursing homes can manipulate this, the, uh, the reporting of, of staffing for many years, but even after the new um, uh, CMS system, payroll-based journal system, as reported, as was reported uh, this past weekend in the New York Times. And again, during the pandemic, uh, in many cases, staffing levels were even um, lower than they were prior to the pandemic. Now, uh, neglect uh, in care homes can cause uh, devastating consequences, as we will see, this is well documented. Those of you who didn't watch the film, the PBS Frontline film, Life and Death in Assisted Living, uh, I think it's important to watch it. Now, we're all also aware of persisting barriers and disincentives for reporting uh, neglect. You know, you, you know, it could be a basic lack of awareness of, of, of the problem of, of this form of mistreatment. Uh, it could have issues with, with a lack of training, lack of screening. Uh, it could be staff members that are concerned to report uh, due to concern for their, they will reflect negatively on their job performance or that there will be a disciplinary action against them. Uh, care homes may be concerned about regulatory uh, issues such as citations, adverse publicity, um, uh, fear of lawsuits. Uh, of course, many residents have uh, dementia and advanced stages of dementia, which is a persistent barrier. Of course, if it happens behind closed doors, for example, and the residents are unable to uh, convey in words or recall the details of the incident. And then there's fear of ret retaliation for residents and family members, but also uh, uh, in, in some cases, staff members. Now, uh, it's also important to remember that there are conditions that may resemble neglect, and you can see them on the slide here. Now, a little bit of background about neglecting care homes in Minnesota. Uh, between fiscal year 2011 and, two, and 2017, going in, into 18, there has been a sharp increase in uh, allegation of mistreatment uh, in assisted living residences um, um, across the state. Uh, and in November 2017, uh, Chris Sears of the Star Tribune uh, published a five-part um, special report uh, reporting on uh, hundreds of uh, incidents where residents were neglected, abused, sexually assaulted, uh, or robbed. Um, the report caused um, an earthquake in the landscape in long-term care in Minnesota. Um, several days after the report was released, the uh, health commissioner um, stepped down from his position. Um, and uh, there were, the Minnesota Department of Health started a, a long process of reform um, also uh, due to another report that I'm going to share with you in a minute uh, by the Office of Legislative Auditor. So um, a few months after the report was released, uh, the, the Left to Suffer series, uh, the former governor Dayton came out and said that although the Department of Health is partially to blame, the real responsibility falls on each and every one of the care providers. They need to fix the problems, stop breaking state laws and follow moral codes. And that's the report that I mentioned earlier. Um, the Minnesota Office of Legislative Auditor conducted a, a lengthy audit of the Office of Health Facility Com Complaints of the Department of Health. This is the unit that conducts investigations and care homes of mistreat mistreatment. And uh, it was a scathing 100 page report that showed uh, uh, a real dysfunction at the agency at the time. Um, and the bottom line was that the agency did not fulfill its mission to protect vulnerable adults in long-term care homes. One of the recommendations in the report was that the urgent need to better use complaint and investigation data for uh, prevention, which the new Commissioner of Health strongly agreed with. 
Uh, she also said that uh, we spend 98% of our efforts responding to issues rather than prevention. Uh, and this has direct relevance to uh, neglect as well. Now, David Wright uh, from CMS said in a consumer voice conference uh, several years ago, uh, he asked, what are we accomplishing if we find the same deficiencies every, every year? We should not be the historians of bad things that happen in nursing homes. We need to be preventive of bad things from happening. We need more analysis. We need to make sure that everything we do is effective and efficient. Um, I mean, when you think about it, every year thousands of complaints, I'm sorry, thousands of investigation reports are piled up um, across the nation. And the question is, uh, who is looking into those reports to uh, use the insights that could be gleaned from them for prevention? Uh, I actually visited the Minnesota Historical Society where hundreds of MDH investigation reports from decades ago are sitting in boxes. Uh, and, and when you look at some of those reports, the same issues of neglect uh, were uh, investigated and substantiated back then. What are we learning from these reports? And what is our goal? Our goal is to uh, learn so that we can prevent future injuries and deaths in similar circumstances. Um, when you look at the, um, uh, when uh, CMS, uh, when state survey agencies um, identify a violation of federal, reg federal nursing home regulations, they may cite a, a, a citation. Uh, unfortunately, to my knowledge, the uh, citations pertaining to neglect, uh, those that are shown here on the screen, both in the old FDAC system and in the new one, are collapsed together with other forms of mistreatment. And this is um, a systemic um, uh, barrier for learning. Uh, if we had an FTAC that is um, solely dedicated to neglect uh, or a sub category of an FTAG, um, we could have in one click literally used national data set to compile all those incidents uh, into one file and, and uh, analyze them. Instead, we need to sift through the, many of them to identify those that were uh, cited as uh, neglect. The same goes for resident to resident incidents uh, that are often cited under abuse, but also under at least eight other F tags, as I was told by CMS. And take, for example, the, the violation related to accidents. There are many subtypes of accidents, all right? So if they're all collapsed under one F tag, are we in a position to learn about the subtypes of these uh, sources of harm for residents so that we can learn and prevent similar uh, incidents in the future? So the, the aim of my exploratory study were to identify what I call trajectories, sequence of events leading to uh, neglect and harm, identify some patterns underlying neglect and some preliminary directions for prevention. Now, the key really is to, for me was at least to uh, submit data practices requests to Minnesota Department of Health uh, under a very consumer, a consumer friendly uh, data practices request act in Minnesota. It's basically the equivalent of a FOIA request. Uh, and I received 429 investigation reports that were substantiated as neglect, all the identified public records. I excluded 129 of them. I went carefully through them too, but I excluded 129 of them that I thought did not reach the threshold of serious bodily injury. And we'll see a definition in a minute. The final data set, uh, 300 investigation reports resulting in, in uh, serious bodily injury. I'm gonna use the acronym SBI or death in nursing home and assisted living in Minnesota. Uh, the investigation reports concluded between 2013 and early 2020 prior to the pandemic. And this is the equivalent of nearly four years of investigators work. And I thought it's, I thought it's worthwhile if they spent so much time and effort to conduct these investigations and write up the reports, we might as well take a look at these reports and try to make sense of them. So here's a definition of serious bodily injury from the Affordable Care Act. An injury involving extreme physical pain, involving substantial risk of death, uh, involving loss of, or impairment of function or an organ, require, or requiring medical intervention such as surgery or hospitalization. It could also consist of criminal sexual abuse. 
So in my preliminary analysis, and again, it's work in progress, there's still many ways in which I can analyze the data, uh, qualitative review of 300 investigation reports. And the goal was really to abstract the narratives into trajectories and to identify patterns to inform prevention. Um, here you see kind of a high level view of the number of investigation reports broken down by setting. You can see that um, 161 of these uh, reports uh, uh, were uh, addressing uh, serious bodily injury and 139 um, reported on, on a death uh, related to neglect. Uh, but it's very important to recognize that there's a lot of suffering that uh, residents experience and trauma, even if uh, a neglect does not reach the level of serious bodily injury. Here you have a resident who um, was assisted, uh, but with an unsafe transfer, which led to a fall. The resident was crawling for nearly four hours on the floor, on hands and knees with bowel movement, uh, uh, soiled with bowel movement, and staff were uh, walking past the resident without acknowledging or, wa or watching TV, reading magazine, and, live and seen leaving the area several times. This was caught on camera. Um, so again, uh, talking about disregard, right? We're gonna come back to this concept. Uh, the perpetrator uh, who neglected the individual falsely also documented the incident and the care uh, provided. Here you have a resident who is uh, had staff assigned to assist uh, in, in toileting with toileting during the night shift. The resident goes to the bathroom at 2 a.m. and the commode that was placed over the toilet was too small. Uh, the legs of the commode gave out and the residents became wedged on the toilet, could not get up. Uh, the resident used the call button and screamed for help. Nobody came. A resident Another resident went to find staff. Staff was asleep. It ended up that the fire department arrived at 5 a.m. to assist the resident over the toilet. Uh, thinking about three hours uh, in emotional, physical pain on the toilet, waiting for help. Another resident with cognitive impairment on a memory care unit. I don't like that term because the care is provided to human beings and not to memories, but that's the term that is used on the investigation reports. Required hourly checks Checks and assistance with ADLs were not provided, uh, repeatedly found soaked in urine and sometimes in feces. It was so bad that the mattress had to be replaced. Uh, there's also situations where a neglect allegation is determined as unsubstantiated, right? But we also need to look at these. Here you have a 77 year old resident that was attacked by his roommate and he experienced a severe brain injury that required emergency brain surgery. Uh, the state surveyors determined that it was unsubstantiated because there was no history of altercation. Staff could not have anticipated the unexpected and sudden altercation. But looking closely at this case, uh, there were warning signs prior to the attack. In fact, the resident himself said, I told him that if I have to spend one more night with this man, then I would kill myself. They still ignored me. The daughter reportedly said that she begged for a different roommate. How many times we were supposed to warn them? The daughter sued the nursing homes for neglect and won the lawsuit. There's also a um, long, long document, you know, <clears throat> documented for many years, what is called understatement, where citations issued by the state survey agency are issued at a severity level that is lower than it should be. Uh, and I wanna also refer you to the fabulous um, series of um, LTCCC, Elder Justice uh, No Harm Newsletter with the link here that provides detailed description of some of these um, incidents. In some cases, the alleged neglect is not even in investigated. Here you have a 90 year old woman with Alzheimer's disease. For hundreds of times, she, she calls uh, for help. Um, she falls off the bed and um, nobody comes to assist her. At some point she said, please help me Lord. Uh, this was all um, on camera. So um, nobody comes to assist her. In total, she called 240 times, uh, 242 times over one hour and 38 minutes, uh, really begging for help. And the daughter saw it in real time on a hidden camera and she alerted the staff who only then came to assist her in changing her adult dependent. Now, it's important to recognize that uh, this uh, woman, Gloria, was paying $6,810 each month for, for this. 
but the daughter's voice uh, was heard. She met with uh, Senator Scott Diebel, who is a, um, a real champion and dedicated to the protection of elders uh, in care homes in Minnesota. And she shared her deeply personal traumatic story with, with him. Um, and uh, along with other efforts, uh, he called for the legislative auditor to investigate the OHFC handling of um, mistreatment allegations. Um, and as we've, we've seen this report, this really, really important report uh, earlier. And the daughter wrote, my goal is to obtain the basic dignity and safety and care my mom deserves. You can actually see an excerpt from this uh, hidden video camera footage in the TV segment that, was, that aired recently. The daughter said, something is fundamentally wrong with a system that allows an elderly woman, anyone elderly, to be disregarded. Uh, and we also have uh, many cases across the country where uh, residents um, are neglected during COVID-19 period. Here you have an example of a resident with Lewy body dementia in an assisted living memory care, paying $9,000 a month uh, for the care. On March 18, the family visits are discontinued and uh, deterioration um, uh, is uh, a documented law, lost of, the resident uh, lost a lot of weight, uh, uh, toenails growing into the skin in pain, uh, several falls in a short period of time. Now, at that point, there is unable to walk and requires two staff transfer. On June 10, the daughter decides to take him home. And this is what she saw when she came to take her father. He was shaking uncontrollably. He was bruised head to toe and he was moaning in pain. At this point, reportedly, a director came in and told the daughter, you know, if you're gonna take your father home, you need to know that you're responsible for the payment for the remainder of the month. Um, so that's what she had, or she or he had in mind at that point uh, when the individual is, is suffering in the room. His genital, genitalia was bright red and the skin was sloughing off. A healthcare worker described his treatment as severe neglect. Uh, the resident died two days after uh, he was moved home uh, with he, when his family were, were right next to him. The daughter reflected on this uh, uh, ongoing neglect. I think it comes down to isolation, the loneliness and the neglect. Our loved ones are dying, not due to COVID-19, but due to isolation and neglect. This was one of the most painful and excruciating experiences of our lives. There's actually, uh, I actually added uh, links to uh, the CAR-11 TV segment uh, on this uh, uh, neglect. Uh, we're nine months since the resident died and we're still waiting for MDH to complete its investigation. Unless there's a com compelling reason that the investigation has not been completed, uh, we know that nine months after the death, it could be very difficult, sometimes impossible to gather evidence to substantiate a, an allegation of neglect. And there's a nursing home in Minnesota, uh, uh, called, uh, called Northridge, where 102 residents died. Uh, and there was this uh, in-depth investigative reporting uh, article, again, by Chris Sears, um, and uh, with uh, documenting the failures across the board that contributed to many of these uh, preventable uh, deaths. Um, and the question that I asked myself, shall we just disregard it and grant this nursing home uh, legal immunity? I also want to point out uh, that even in states where, even in those states where uh, broad legal immunity protections are not passed, uh, it is important to recognize that in many cases, many care homes already have COVID liability shields de facto, meaning in effect, for at least two dozen reasons that I describe with my colleagues in a, in a uh, guest blog post uh, with Changing Aging that we called a perfect storm. So here are some of the preliminary findings in my uh, exploratory uh, study. Still it's in, in, in its uh, initial phases. Uh, nearly half of the residents had some level of cognitive impairment. Uh, I believe many more had cognitive impairment and dementia because oftentimes cognitive impairment or dementia is not either not being uh, diagnosed or not being documented in investigation reports, but still. And dozens of others had stroke, Parkinson's disease, or traumatic brain injury. 
Many had med medically were, were medically dependent due to various complex health care conditions, and many were physically dependent on the staff for extensive assistance with activities of daily living. Uh, some of the primary consequences on these residents, tremendous emotional, psychological suffering, um, ER visits and hospitalization that are mostly uh, preventable, and the substantial healthcare costs that um, are triggered by these hospitalizations. Many experienced uh, uh, physical dec uh, decline in their condition, and many moved to higher level of care. Um, many of them experienced traumatic physical injuries and of course, uh, death. Now it's important to recognize that uh, a significant portion of employees that uh, were determined as neglectful were terminated or they resigned. And there's also uh, two, at least two kinds of costs that come along with that. According to three estimates, it takes, it costs $2,200 to $4,000 to replace a single care employee. Uh, and then there's, of course, the unknown cost of a perpetrator that um, crosses the street, so to speak, to work in a different care home and possibly continuing to mistreat other residents. So when uh, state surveyors in Minnesota uh, substantiate neglect, they are um, instructed to uh, make a determination who was responsible for the mistreatment in over three quarters of the 300 uh, uh, substantiated neglect incidents it was the long-term care home and i think that's an important finding because it goes back to the accountability issues which we're going to discuss uh, in a few minutes um, it's actually higher than that because in eight uh, percent it was both the long-term care and an individual determined as responsible and I honestly believe after reviewing so many of these investigation reports that some of these uh, uh, incidents uh, should be considered criminal or fraud. Uh, so going back to the tra trajectory, sequence of neglectful events resulting in harm. And two of the most prevalent forms of neglect in Minnesota long-term care homes, at least in recent years, are neglect of healthcare and neglect of supervision. So I'm gonna give a few examples here of neglect of uh, healthcare in assisted living in Minnesota. Uh, here you have wellness checks that are not done and several residents found injured or dead many hours or two or more days later. Resident with dementia falls at night, uh, fractures hair or his arm, calls for help using the call button at nearly 2 a.m. left and answers for six hours found by the morning shift staff at 8 a.m. Lack of fall risk assessment and prevention leading to injurious falls such as hip fracture with no post fall assessment. Unsafe transfers leading to several injurious and falls and deaths. A resident with TBI and stroke uh, repositioning not being done, developing a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter pressure sore, no intervention provided, and the resident develop a pressure sore 25 centimeter by 25 centimeter. I don't know if you can see it, but it's at the size of a cake pan. The resident experiences uh, septic shock and dies. Uh, here you have a resident in a memory care home. The catheter did not drain. The resident developed E. coli, septic shock, and eventually died. Uh, extreme cases of high blood uh, pressure, I'm sorry, uh, high sugar levels uh, leading to deaths. Resident with uh, a large bulge on the stomach. Uh, one person described the resident as a pregnant woman with twins, moaning in pain, delays in recognition, experiencing strangulated hernia eventually leading to uh, his death. Resident with cognitive impairment in pain, a metal object found in, in his heel, uh, developed infection uh, and eventually died. Medication errors leading to several deaths of residents. A resident with dementia using a wheelchair on a secured unit, able to leave via unsecured door by the dining room, falls off a flight of stairs, severe injuries, and died. A resident with dementia exits via the second floor door, fell on stairs, experiences subdural hematoma, and dies uh, a couple of weeks later. A resident with dementia, wellness checks not being done, uh, left the building unattended, found dead in a pond. Staff unaware that the resident moved into a memory care unit for 18 hours. 
found with the head wedged between the toilet and the wall and the resident died. Residents with Alzheimer's disease found with a neck entrapped between the bed and transfer pole and died. Three residents with dementia cleaning the detergent supply left unattended, unlocked. Uh, the residents gained access to these, experienced severe burns to their intestines and died. Residents requiring monitoring for suicide attempts, no stop supervision at night, managed to break into a locked medication cabinet, ingested 85 doses of medications in an attempted suicide. Residents with Alzheimer's disease that is known to be up most nights, walks at night in a common area, staff is seen on a camera footage sleeping on a sofa. The resident fell, experienced femur fracture and died. Resident with dementia uh, and heart failure, staff failed to plug the heart pump at bedtime uh, and the battery depleted, the resident died. Resident with dementia engaged in a repeated altercation, resident to incidents, lack of supervision intervention, leading to several injuries such as hip fracture and head injuries. And here you have a case where a resident with uh, borderline personality uh, disorder and intellectual disability managed to gain access to large nails. She takes a shoe, bangs the nails into her head, uh, and she complains about headaches and swelling on the forehead for, for weeks, which is reportedly not addressed. And only a month, nearly a month later, a CAT scan reveals two nails in her, inside her frontal lobe and it requires surgical removal and, and ongoing treatment. Those of you who still want to read about additional uh, injurious and, and deadly neglectful incidents in the Minnesota assisted living residences, you can uh, read the, our report, Inhumane and Deadly Neglect. Uh, a link is provided on this slide. Now to take a little pause, I know it's a lot uh, to process. Uh, I want to ask the question, how many legislators, lawmakers, will actually take the time to, to read long investigation reports? This one has six pages at the core, the, at the outset of the report. Um, we know that most of them probably won't be able to read uh, many of these reports, right? So we came up with uh, Elder Voice Family Advocates, we came up with the, uh, what we call the one-page summary of conclusion, where the second box on this page uh, you can read what actually happened, the trajectory, in about 15 or 20 seconds. Uh, and you can compile them in a Word document and then share them with, with lawmakers uh, to point out gaps in care and need for legislation uh, to protect residents. If they have more time, they can read a summary uh, in the subsequent segment. And then they can see also some details about the care home, including where the, uh, the address of the care home uh, so that the uh, legislator or the representative know whether these uh, cases occurred in their district. Um, moving to neglect of healthcare in nursing homes. A resident with um, heart failure and diabetes experiences a, a clear change in condition since 4 p.m., including calling Help Me God. Um, but there were delays of nearly five hours to call 911, experiences septic shock, and dies the next day. Uh, resident with COPD on low flow oxygen experiences COT poisoning, which is not recognized and the resident died. Unsafe transfer led to 16 serious bodily injuries and 16 deaths. I should say unsafe transfer against instructions in the care plan. Residents requiring food pedals on a wheelchair during transfer, the food pedal not used on the way to the dining room, the resident fell forward, fractured the vertebrate in the neck and died. Resident with stroke, uh, being assisted with a mechanical ceiling lift transfer uh, to the commode. The resident is left unsupervised while attached to the ceiling lift against manufacturer's guidelines. The wheels become unlocked, the commode rolls away, the resident falls, the resident's legs fractured, experiencing severe pain and dies days later. Resident with memory lost, the shower cha uh, chair wheel is known to be defective, but not, not maintenance staff are not notified reportedly. Two weeks later, of course, the wheel breaks, the resident falls and experiences subdural, subdural hematoma. A resident with dementia falls, experiences hip fracture, which goes unrecognized for 18 hours, 18 hours with a hip fracture. We should think for ourselves, how would we feel if we would be 
experiencing hip fracture for 18 hours with no assistance. Physician is not notified. It is the family that visits that uh, triggers hospitalization. The residents died five days later. A resident with cancer on chronic pain uh, has a prescription for opioid pain medications prescribed 20 times higher the dose of the residents found dead. Resident with difficulty expressing needs requiring gastric tube feeding. The tube is positioned incorrectly. The residents vomits the formula, no emergency treatment provided. The resident found unresponsive three hours later and dies. Resident with uh, severe cognitive impairment, uh, there's a failure to assess the skin underneath the immo Im immobility boot that was placed post-surgery. A routine external provider visit discovered three unstageable pressure sores leading to hospitalization, sepsis, and death. Resident with severe cognitive impairment enter an unlocked laundry room, enters a cement basin where there were uh, water, uh, extremely hot water, 155 degree, experiences burns and dies. Uh, cognitively impaired resident on a puree diet frequently tries to take food from other residents. A tray with a sandwich is left three feet away for 90 minutes. The resident eats it, chokes and dies. And here you have a resident who is cognitively impaired, uh, found with heavy labored breathing, oxygen level 78%, receives supplemental oxygen, but reportedly never goes above 89%. Physician is not notified. Still, despite all this, the resident is being prepared for an unrelated appointment. Uh, reportedly, they, were, they did not check, reach, did not recheck the vital signs. The van driver asked if he or she should be on oxygen during the ride. The response reportedly was no, and that the resident would be all right. The resident arrived two and a half hours later with no pulse. Uh, and the resident dies. Uh, I'm gonna skip uh, uh, these incidents. You can read them later, uh, also related to neglect of supervision in, in uh, nursing homes in the interest of time. Uh, I'm just gonna mention the last one, several residents with dementia left unattended on the toilet against care plan leading to injurious falls. Here you have uh, four ventilator related deaths. Uh, and one of them was disconnected for 11 minutes <clears throat> and not addressed. One of them was removed too early against uh, physician order. One of them, the tube was detached in alarm, but not discovered until an hour later. And the last one was activated for nearly 40 minutes, but uh, the team were understaffed and the nurse was assisting on another wing. There was no response and the resident died. Uh, the three last deaths, took place in the same nursing home. So thinking about kind of overarching theme, the vast majority of the emotional and physical traumas and deaths uh, that we heard about today could have been prevented uh, if uh, adequate proactive anticipatory measures would have been taken. Some of these you can see here on the slide. And we have reports from care, pro care professionals who, who, who were included in the investigation report that said that in one case, the trauma and hospitalization could have been prevented with earlier intervention. A nurse said, when in doubt, call the nurse. And why didn't they call the ambulance sooner? Another uh, a physician said, somebody should have said something. It, it would have prolonged his life. So some of the contributing factors to the neglect in those 300 uh, incidents include lack or inadequate nursing assessment, uh, omission of or inadequate uns or unskilled or unsafe actions, a lot of communication lapses, problems and breakdowns that could have saved lives, dangerous delays, organizational factors such as unsafe staffing levels and lack of nurse manager supervision. Some of the preliminary patterns that could be gleaned from this analysis is lack again of basic nursing and risk assessment, lack of thorough and timely internal investigation, what we call root cause analysis that can inform prevention, failure to recognize warning signs and significant change in condition, delays in seeking emergency, emergency medical care, lack of basic care assistance and timely interventions, lack of or inadequate or not following care plans, uh, other issues, of course, is the lack or 
of adequate supervision of many residents with advanced stages of dementia, secured care units that are not secured, uh, lack of or inadequate nursing manager supervision of daycare staff, as I mentioned earlier, um, not notifying super, supervising nurse and physician, families left in the dark, um, multiple discoveries by family by visiting family members or external providers that came for a visit or during completely an outside appointment or not having or following internal policies and procedures. In conclusion, um, one can't help or I can't help but describe many of those neglectful incidents as disregard to the fate and suffering of vulnerable and frail elders in a subgroup of long-term care homes in Minnesota. There's an urgent need to go back to the fundamental principles of the nursing profession, which is largely missing in action in many, uh, certainly in many uh, assisted living residences uh, in Minnesota and other states. Shift from reactive care mode to proactive anticipatory nursing assessment-based care and require and fund safe people-to-people -people ratios at all times, including uh, evenings, weekends, and holidays of well-trained staff, and commit to a culture of learning, create mechanism or strengthen mechanism for sharing lessons across care homes. In conclusion, we need to do everything we can to break the silence and dangerous normalization of elder neglect in long-term care settings. And I think it's worth asking ourselves, would we accept these horrific incidents in childcare settings? We must, we must hold owners and administrators of neglectful long-term care homes accountable. In the words of the new commissioner of health in Minnesota, our protections in law are only as good as the enforcement capabilities, which we know are weak in many uh, parts of, of the country. Uh, this is something that is known for many, many years, not only in nursing homes, but also in assisted living residences, or I should say particularly in assisted living residences. And we need to make sure that um, key agencies uh, that are listed here on the slide uh, would uh, become much more involved in prevention, investigation, and prosecution of uh, elder mistreatment in general and care homes, uh, and particularly uh, injurious and deadly neglect of um, residents. Uh, there's also a key role for hospitals, em emergency medical services personnel, uh, firefighters, uh, fire departments, and funeral home directors that often can detect something suspicious on the body of a resident. Um, and I also strongly urge any place in the country and beyond to establish elder death review teams as well as elder abuse forensic centers. And I can send you resources uh, if you're interested to uh, work on developing these centers and teams. Uh, we also need to make sure that uh, we're actually using a very, very potentially powerful requirement to report reasonable suspicion of a crime in nursing homes in the United States. And there are very strong requirements uh, for reporting suspicious, um, when there's a serious bodily injury that is suspicious uh, caused by a crime uh, with very strict timelines and very hefty uh, uh, fines and also uh, personal responsibility of care employees uh, for reporting, including um, there are uh, strong protections for employees um, against retaliation against employees who lawfully report uh, these, these crimes. And there's a link here to CMS memo, memo about it. There's a long way to go in terms of actually implementing this uh, very, very important uh, requirement that a lot of uh, um, family members, for example, uh, are not aware of. And I wanna just kind of uh, give a, a to point you to a very, very uh, useful uh, uh, serious, I'm sorry, a webpage on long-term care community coalition website that is called Abuse, Neglect and uh, Crime Reporting Center with fabulous resources uh, for uh, residents, families, advocates that go uh, well beyond uh, New York. Uh, we also need to remember, why do we need to screen for neglect? 
uh, because it's often uh, not a single sign that leads to it, but multiple signs. And because we want to make sure that it's not being missed and that it's intercepted, uh, or that there's intervention to prevent harm uh, in time. And also because without screening, it is unlikely to that reporting will improve. I want to uh, kind of mention uh, there's a couple of uh, instruments uh, to detect uh, neglect that could be used in staff training uh, programs. Uh, but I also mentioned some gaps in these instruments uh, and the fact that uh, oftentimes they're not being used in long-term care homes, such as assisted living residences. Um, so I want to uh, close by um, uh, sharing with you real briefly about um, the late 86-year-old uh, uh, Werner Allen, the father of Chris Sandberg, Executive Director of Elder Voice Family Advocates in Minnesota. Um, wellness checks were promised, but his body was left in his room for seven days without a wellness check. A neighbor reportedly asked the staff to check on him while the papers were piling up outside his room. As Chris uh, shared with me yesterday, the only thing they had to say as we waited in the hall smelling his decomposing body was, you need to get his room cleaned out by the end of the month. I also wanna uh, refer you here to uh, a, a poem that I wrote recently about the promise of um, assisted living residences, but it can also, I should say the broken promise of assisted living residences it happens all too often across the country. Um, and you can uh, read it in this link. Um, we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna just mention that it, it's very important to re-emphasize that it is the human right. Uh, and in many cases, it's the federal right of elders to live in safe long-term care homes. Uh, and here you see um, the picture of 84-year-old um, Jacqueline Oregon, uh, who uh, was, um, verbally abused and neglected in a care home uh, for people with dementia in Minnesota. Um, I, I was very glad that her daughters were willing to share this uh, uh, picture that shows her in such a dignified, dignified way so that we will remember that uh, they are whole human beings with equal rights like any, any of us. And I'm gonna close here and we're gonna open for question and discussion and the time that we have left. Thank you for, for uh, joining us today. Thanks, uh, thanks, Yvonne. And be before the Q and A, uh, I just wanted I, I call your attention to LTCCC's webinar for next month, April twentieth, uh, the antidote to ageism in nursing or an antidote to ageism in nursing homes, and it's going to feature Kathy Uncino, who you might have heard in uh, some of our previous programs, and she will uh, discuss how residents, staff, uh, families uh, can be inspired to become needed change agents in the transformed uh, culture. Uh, and Kathy just has so many amazing stories that we can all learn from. Uh, Haley, uh, I think just posted something in the chat uh, about how you can register for the program. Uh, so thanks all for joining this one and um, then we'll go ahead with Q and A. <clears throat> thanks Eric and, and Elon, thank you so much for a, a really superb um, presentation and the chat you know, coming in, just uh, someone just posted excellent information. Keep it up, Dr. Caspi. <laughs> uh, and yes, so we hope that you'll keep it up as well. So let me um, really, really so thoughtful and thought provoking. So, so thank you. Um, we have a question from Catherine. Um, <clears throat> do you see more abuse, death, injury, and neglect in for profit than in not for profit or government VA nursing homes? Um. Well, uh, this analysis did not uh, look at this aspect. I mean, it is possible to retrospectively perhaps do that, but we do know that uh, in general, repeatedly we've seen reports uh, that uh, for-profit uh, long-term care homes have uh, poor quality of care across the board, 
uh, including uh, different forms of mistreatment. Uh, but we also have seen it in a GAO report uh, in the context of infections prior to the pandemic that they had substantially higher levels of uh, um, in, in infections in for-profit uh, nursing homes for years. Uh, we know that there's lower staffing levels. And as we said, as Tom from the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit said that you know, poor staffing levels equals neglect. So the answer is yes, we do see those trends. However, I think it's very important to caution as, as Richard educated us uh, in a fabulous symposium last fall that you know, many for, uh, non-for-profit uh, care homes uh, also uh, could neglect uh, residents, but by and large, the trends are, are, are pretty clear. We're also seeing it during the pandemic that for-profit um, nursing home, uh, we have multiple reports that and studies that show that higher uh, out, number of outbreaks and, and death in those in those settings. So, so I think the general answer is yes. To what extent we have a granular um, analysis at the level of subtypes of mistreatment, that's a question that we need to look uh, closer into. Uh, thank you for your question, Catherine. Thank you, Elon. It's very interesting. Uh, our next question is, is there a national average of how long it takes state agencies to investigate cases of neglect from the time the neglect is reported to them to the time the investigation takes place? Uh, that's, that's an excellent question. I am myself grappling and struggling with this uh, question for years um, and you know you know I want to think that some state survey agencies provide that information but uh, in my case uh, I wasn't I wasn't able or at least I don't see it publicly reported um, because when the complaint is the uh, alleged neglect is being submitted between the time it's submitted and the time that the investigation takes place um, we know that as the time passes, the likelihood of a surveyor or investigator to collect evidence is reduced substantially. Um, and so the, the short answer is, is, is no, I'm not fully aware. Um, I tried to actually search for that information and I, was, I personally wasn't able. So if anybody else knows about uh, in any state, region or nationally, I would appreciate if you can, if you can share that with us. An excellent question. Um, I think it was reported in, a, in some government report that I was able to track recently and I can try to find it, but uh, I don't, this is not information that is, um, let's just say, widely uh, shared with the public. Thanks, Elon. And, and I would just add, um, there, there, is, there are requirements for the state agencies, you know, the Department of Health or the Department of Public Health to respond to complaints uh, in, in, in a certain time frame, especially, and it has to be within, I think, is it 24 hours if, if, the, if the complaint alleges um, harm or immediate jeopardy to the resident. Uh, it might be 48, I forget offhand, but it's quickly, and then they have more time um, to do it if it's not a complaint alleging harm to a resident. The issue, as you can imagine, is that the states tend to do a very poor job of triaging the complaints that they get and saying, oh, this complaint sounds like someone is really being hurt or, um, or dehumanized um, or, you know, is, is at risk of being hurt or dehumanized and we should get in there. Um, so that's one of the problems. And then the other thing I would just quickly add is I tried to do a quick search when I saw that question come up and I looked, there's a website called QCOR, Q-C-O-R dot C-M-S dot gov, I believe. And they do track the extent to which states do the, their annual enforcement because states are required to inspect facilities on average once, every, once, once a year with a nine to 15 month window for each individual facility. I could not find anything on complaints in terms of the timeliness of the complaint response. Mm -hmm. So as Elon was saying, I, was, I, I, I would guess that states should have that information or should be able to track that. And that's something that CMS in turn should be able to track. Um, but I, um, I don't think it's publicly available either. Thank you, Richard, I wanna just kind of, uh, thank you for your insights on that. Uh, I would just add that uh, I think uh, one of the ways to approach this is to use FOIA requests or in Minnesota data practices requests because the information exists. 
it's about accessing it. And we also are prompted by Richard's comment, we know that CMS conducts uh, audits of state survey agencies uh, investigation, and they do have tables that, that show when, they're, when the state does not comply with the timelines for uh, whether it's a, a, you know, responding to an allegation. Uh, I just not, 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 I'm just not sure if, if we have robust data nationwide about uh, when, and I think that was the question, uh, the actual time in which investigation is actually being uh, conducted after an alleged uh, neglect uh, submitted to the state survey agency. Thanks, Elon. Uh, and I would just ask uh, if you could stop sharing your 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 webinar. So, Eric, if you can post, because I think we should have a link for people to. Um, um, if we have ombudsman on, they can uh, take it. Our serve. We have a quick survey for ombudsman who want to receive credit for having um, participated in this program. Yep, uh, one sec. Okay, thanks. Oh, there you go. And um, that's the, the registration. Yeah. From current slide and I'll go to the next slide here. Okay, oh, great, thanks so much. So yeah, we have that survey monkey at the bottom. And for those in um, uh, who are in Amazon programs um, and we would like to have your Amazon program volunteers participate in this, just shoot us an email feedback at ltccc.org, and we'd be happy to do that. So let me uh, quickly go back, and and uh, Dr. Caspi has um, generously said that he could stay on with us for um, another um, 10 minutes or so, so hopefully we can get through the rest of the questions. Um, so let me ask the, the next one is, uh, what has been done in these incidents? What preventive, what preventive measures are being put in place? Well, um, in assisted living, at least in Minnesota, to my knowledge, at least as of uh, a couple of years ago, it's, it's possible that it's still the case because the licensure has not, largely has not been implemented yet. Uh, um, when you look at, and I think it addresses perhaps part of the question, the plan of corrections. You know, people are not familiar with uh, investigation reports either by uh, state survey agencies for nursing homes or assisted living. You know, in nursing home, there's a federal requirement to conduct a plan of corrections. There's, there's a, you know, a, a different question of to the extent that they are, that they are being done in a, in a thorough way and that they're effective, that's a separate. But in assisted living, you look at the investigation report that sometimes is even constructed as a CMS uh, 2467, uh, whatever the number is, and you see a blank sheet and say, wait a second, there's no, no plan of correction. So uh, to my knowledge, that's a major gap in Minnesota and should be looked at in other states. Uh, if we're not even requiring uh, to have a robust uh, requirement for uh, correcting the, uh, the gaps that, and the deficiencies that caused the harm, um, then what assurance will we have that they won't occur again? Again, it goes back to the enforcement, right? Uh, and it's weak in assisted living, we know that. Thanks, Elon, that, that, that's true. Um, so two questions, um, they're kind of the, the same, but, you know, and they, they, they're kind of, uh, I would say almost you probably answered them to some extent just now, but um, you know, why, why does the mistreatment and neglect continue? Why is CMS and the State Department of Health allowing this to continue to happen? Well, right, so there's, two, there's two short answers. One is uh, ageism and dementism, uh, and I should say ed sexism, uh, because we know who uh, receives, who provides the care, vast majority of women to majority women. So that's an, and then there's racism as well, inequalities that we know in quality of care uh, for people, African Americans, and you know, nursing homes are heavily uh, Medicaid paid. Um, so why is it that why does it occur? I think the short answer after 27 years in the aging field is deeply seated uh, ageism and dementes. What value do we have in our society for, for vulnerable and frail elders, many of whom with dementia? That's the first answer. The second answer is, you know, we've had movements uh, for, uh, for uh, women, for children, for domestic abuse, uh, for uh, and we need uh, for African Americans for you know and we need much more of course on all these fronts, but I haven't seen uh, enough uh, a movement uh, people going to the streets 
to say enough is enough. And it's stunning to me. This happens in Australia and Canada and Israel, where I'm from. And it's just stunning to me. And we know that families are, are depleted and, you know, they're exhausted. Many of them don't want to go back to re-experiencing the trauma. And, and, and that's totally understandable, of course. Uh, but why? Well, one is the ageism and dementism. And the second is what I call nested neglect. And I think I kind of pointed out in that presentation. You know, we need to hold CMS accountable. So my question is, who regulates the regulators? You know, we, we think that, you know, many families say, oh, I'm going to report you to the ombudsman. Ombudsman are dedicated, caring, skilled, you know, loving and caring people. But, you know, in Minnesota for 15 years, we didn't know that the, the ombudsman per bed ratio was one of the five worst in the nation for 15 years, including one to 9,000 uh, bed ratio between ombudsman and bed ratio. How can they accomplish their mission under the older uh, Amer American uh, act, right? Uh, so, so it goes back to uh, pressuring uh, in new and creative ways, pressuring federal agencies and raising public awareness as, as Richard is doing so phenomenally, inspiring all of us with your work with LTCCC and Elder Voice Family Advocates and the Consumer Voice. We need to uh, uh, consolidate efforts. And uh, I, I personally think that at some point we're during a pandemic, I think people need to go to the streets and, and protest. That's my short answer. I know it was a long answer, but that's my honest answer. Thank you, Yolanda. And thanks for your compliment, of course. It's very generous. Um, do you, this is from Rebecca, do any of you feel that stopping visitation during the pandemic was a type of neglect or mistreatment in LTC? Well, we know that um, family members were, many family members were integral part of the care for uh, uh, residents in long-term care homes for many years. So you remove that, you know, in nursing home, majority have dementia, many of them cannot use video chats, which even if they could, it's not the same as being in person in the room and seeing what's going on. So um, being uh, the fact uh, that they were not in for, for many months, uh, remove that safeguard, that critical uh, safeguard. And they are the ones who often notice uh, changes from baseline when the environment are so understaffed and there's such a high staff turnover and float staff and external agency staff and staff, you know, who don't know the residents uh, oftentimes. So, you know, families were, were critically important when they were not part of what's going on, they didn't see, uh, then uh, that safeguard was not in place. So that uh, uh, reduced the ability of already struggling long-term care homes to provide the protections against uh, neglect as they struggle even more with staffing levels during the, the pandemic. And this is not to suggest, to suggest by any means that staff are, are bad people. And as, as I said at the outset, these are caring, loving, dedicated, hardworking, but under-recognized and under-supported under and under-trained uh, individuals oftentimes. So, so yes, I do think that it contributed to uh, a lot of neglect and we're hearing stories from across the country and the world, frankly. Thank you, Elon. Uh, and that, that should be bring me to the next question, which a few people have asked, um, is this report, is, is your report totally focused on Minnesota? And which I, which if so, do you feel that Minnesota is worse than other states or is this everywhere? Are there well, some the states or answer, countries get? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The last part. Are there, are there some states or countries that do a better job with prevention? Thank yeah, you for your work, Dr. Caspi. That's an excellent question, uh, and thank you. Um, well, uh, the short answer for assisted living is that we don't know because, as I call it, assisted living across the country are flying under the radar without a black box. There, we don't know most of the things we should know and we should require and demand to know. Uh, in a highly for-profit uh, sector that provides care to so many vulnerable and frail elders, many of whom with dementia, with serious health, uh, complex healthcare conditions. So uh, to compare between assisted living, um, I personally don't know because in Minnesota, at least, we, we don't have basic information about these, in, these, uh, the care provider, the, the care provided, the, the, the care needs, the, the needs of the population. So how can you compare when you don't have that? So, um, and with regards to other states, you know, I'm, uh, we recently moved from Minnesota to Connecticut, so I'm still learning uh, about what's happening in New England and New York and Connecticut and the, the region here. Uh, I don't know, maybe others can, can chime in if you do know if there's 
uh, robust uh, <laughs> uh, tracking uh, of uh, the care needs in assisted living in New York or in Connecticut. Um, I, I don't know the answer to it, to be, to be honest. And um, are there good models? Well, they're, they're good models of care. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm personally not familiar uh, in assisted living. Again, it's hard to compare because of the lack of requirements of tracking of information. But in nursing homes, you could, uh, you know, you could have a crude, uh, a crude estimation of quality of care. But as we learned, uh, for-profit providers learned how to uh, inflate and manipulate the nurse, the five-star nursing rating system. So even that, I'm I'm reluctant to to suggest. Uh, but if if my parents, if I would have to deal with a situation where my parents need to go to a nursing home and I have to choose between a, a, a one-star nursing home or a five-star nursing home, then I would choose the five-star, of course. But there's there's a lot going on behind the the star system that has been. Um, uh, is biased in many ways. It has value. It has merit. But I would suggest and caution: uh, use it only as a crude, as a crude uh, measure. Um, thanks, thanks, Elon. Um, uh, those are a lot of good, so many good things to talk about. I'm going to take I can take two more questions. Um, one is: um, Can you elaborate on the use of a fraud theory where the neglect appears to have happened within a short period of time? Thank you. That's from Vicky. Um, so, uh, luckily, before the presentation, I looked into the, in the dictionary on the definition of fraud. And I know there's legal definitions, and I'm not a legal scholar, and I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an elder law attorney. There's better people to answer that on that aspect. But from a family perspective, from a resident perspective, that a, a, think about an 85-year-old who worked, she or he worked all their life to earn, uh, to provide for the family, to earn income, and then they retire, they develop, say, dementia, they go to an assisted living uh, for people with dementia, and they, they pay $9,000 a month or $7,000 a month, um, and, um, and then they find, and, and they, they go in those tours, and it looks like hotel, and all the promises are made, and then shortly after, the family and the resident uh, learn that there are no adequate staffing, there's no training, there's no risk assessment, uh, there's no accountability. In Minnesota, it's hard to even know who, uh, who is uh, responsible for the care and who owns the, the, the care setting uh, in many cases. So um, the definition of fraud in the dictionary is uh, deceit and trickery, an act of deceiving or misrepresenting or, or misrepresenting. Okay, an act of deceiving or misrepresenting. So I'm not talking from a legal standpoint, but if you spend nine thousand dollars of your hard-earned, lifelong, hard-earned money, and you get you're being severely neglected to the point that you experience serious bodily injury or death, and I don't know how else to to describe it. Thank you. Um, so, and the last question is: Do you find incidents of neglect are more common in facilities with a higher number of minority residents? Well, I think the answer is yes, but this study did not, uh, did not, I don't have access to data in this data set. So, uh, but again, we know that it has been repeatedly shown that uh, uh, people with low income uh, in, in uh, for example, nursing home heavily paid by Medicaid, uh, where uh, in, in African-Americans, uh, that particularly receive lower quality of care across the board. Uh, and I hope that um, what the, uh, the largest uh, uh, humanitarian disaster in the history maybe of in public health in this country will, will prompt us now to look more closely at those questions to ensure as, as Richard is advocating that, you know, if you are a low income resident on Medicaid, uh, African American, you have the federal right, right, Richard, to receive the exact same quality of care as any other resident in the long-term care home. 
So thank you for that, Richard, and thank you for, for, for the question. Uh, a long way to go, and I, I hope that we will see more and more studies looking into it, but maybe, maybe Richard, you're aware of, of studies like that. Um, there, there certainly have been studies over the years that, that have shown that, that um, facilities that serve a, um, a, a largely African-American um, community tend to have um, lower staffing and poor outcomes, even accounting for payment source and resident acuity. Mean the needs of their residents. So yeah, it is. There have been there have been a number of studies, and I think it's a, uh, you know, obviously it's a very important issue, and I I hope that we'll we'll be addressing it in a meaningful way going forward because too many things get sloughed off, even by you know legislators on both the state and Congress. They you know maybe are well meaning, maybe not, but but they don't really think about how to address some of these long-standing, you know, systemic issues and get underneath that, what, what is causing them to be perpetuated. That's unfortunately what we see over and over again. Um, Elon, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, thanks Eric for emceeing. And we look forward to seeing you in a month again. Here on the, is the slide for the Survey Monkey. If you're an Amazon program and your supervisor, your program has said that you can take this as, you know, one of our webinars as a, um, as a training program, we're, we're happy to work with the Amazon for that. And for updates and invites to future programs, visit us at nursinghome411.org forward slash join. Thank you again, Elon, for just a very thought provoking. And, and actually, thank you our audience, our audience for great questions. They were really a lot to think about as well for me. And um, I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Richard. And thank you, Eric, for your help. Uh, and uh, I hope everybody can stay safe out there. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye now.